We made a bed in the bed of your dad's pickup Six more weeks staying home till our youth was up In the tall grass I told you that I'd never move on August moved above the river, me and the water sit flat and I knew but I didn't know that it was all set in motion And we couldn't go back In the last summer I made a living out of nostalgia, or maybe sentimentality. The sweet, sad feeling of the day has gone by. They say that the greatest storytellers are the worst liars. And I don't know if I'm a great storyteller, but I am certainly a liar. I lie about the past to make it more colorful, more interesting, to send it in a singular direction. I lie about the past because I want it to be better than it was, full of possibility and magic. The truth, of course, is that the past is complicated. It's messy. The nostalgists among us have forgotten the troubles of the past. It makes 
the ways of the present feel overwhelming like they've never happened before. In 2013, my mother passed away. She passed away in a hospice ward in Spokane, Washington on the day after her 58th birthday. Much like the cornerstone events of the past, death comes quietly and without fanfare. Or as my mother explained to me, death comes in the middle. That's why people look kind of confused all the time, she said. Because in the movies that we watch, in the books that we read, the end comes at the end. But in life, the end comes in the middle. She was doing me a courtesy, knowing that it would be confusing, the events to come would be confusing for someone who had twisted the past into form at every opportunity. In the months prior, we went about tasks, tasks that she called tidying. We wrapped the aspen saplings and chicken wire to protect them from the deer. And we went to the gym to cancel her membership. At the gym, there was a, a very muscly 20-something standing behind the, the desk with a name tag that said Kyle. Kyle had been trained to uh, resist people trying to cancel their memberships. <laughs> Why are you canceling your membership, asked Kyle. My mom with a big smile on her face, she says, because I'm going to die pretty soon. This was a new one for Kyle. Does that mean you can't work out anymore, Kyle asked. <laughs> My mom was like five feet tall, and this guy was like mid, mid sixes, and she reached across the counter and put her hand on his shoulder, and she said, Kyle, you're doing a great job. <laughs> but, and I'm quoting here, you should probably read the room. On the drive home from the gym, my mom scooted across the bench, seat, the bench seat of the pickup truck, sat next to me, and she asked me a question. She said, what are you going to do? What am I going to do? You are bad at feeling sad, she said. Whenever something sad happens, you wrap it up into something bigger, more romantic, and less sad than it is. And then she said something I'll never forget. She said, sorrow and joy are holding hands. Sorrow and joy are holding hands, I said. When I'm gone, I want you to do something stupid and irresponsible, my mother said. This is, I think, the worst uh, maternal advice in the history of mothers. <laughs> said, I want you to do something irresponsible, and while you're doing that irresponsible thing, I want you to think about why you're sad that I'm gone. And I want you to think about how sorrow and joy are holding hands. What kind of irresponsible thing, I said. I don't know. She said you do irresponsible stuff all the time. Just pick something. <laughs> In the end, the irresponsible thing that I decided to do was to walk really far. More specifically, I decided to walk from San Diego, California to San Francisco, California. 600 miles of coastline along some of the busiest and most terrible freeways in America. If I wanted to do it in a month, I'd need to walk about 20 miles a day. I'd need to take in between four and 6,000 calories. I need to drink seven liters of water, all of which I would need to carry in a state that is notoriously without water. If I was gonna, if there weren't any campgrounds around at night, I would need to find a quiet and overlooked place to sleep where I wouldn't, you know, get run over or robbed. Quiet and overlooked places in locations such as Los Angeles. None of these were things that I planned for. <laughs> Landing my idea firmly within the category of my mother's assignment. <laughs> On the first day, my legs cramped up. I couldn't bend them any more than about this much right here. On the fifth day, my feet, or my, uh, yeah, my feet went numb on the fifth day, uh, and they stayed numb for the rest of the time. On the 25th day, I was standing at the mouth of Big Sur. I'd lost over 50 pounds. I like to think of Big Sur as having a mouth, not in the way 
that a river, or not in the way that an animal has a mouth, or a river has a mouth, but in the way that an animal has a mouth, it looks like um, like some giant sea creature that just washed ashore a thousand years ago and started to sprout golden reeds and ponderosa trees. Down south, the shoulders were glorious. They were six feet wide. Plenty of space to dodge, you know, people falling asleep at the wheel or scrolling through Instagram. But here in Big Sur, the, shor- the shoulders narrowed and narrowed and narrowed until at certain points they were only six inches wide. It was here that I discovered my nemesis, the retiree. <laughs> the retirees to be, fear- to be feared the most came from the state of Texas. They would drag uh, camper trailers around the corners at 60 miles an hour. Camper trailers large enough to house like two dozen freelancers in any American city. And the air coming off these things was enough to blow me off the edge. If I saw them coming, I'd have to find something to grab onto. If I was lucky, there was a guardrail. There's a couple times where I almost didn't hold on. On the 27th day, I walked into a field. The field, it turned out, was made up entirely of poison oak and stinging nettles. I hadn't taken a shower since Santa Barbara. The next morning when I woke up, I had blisters from the poison oak, and I had scratched through the blisters from the stinging nettles, all of which had mixed together with the dirt on my skin, covering me in a beautiful maroon-colored mud. (laughs) Sounds, Sounds fun, huh? On the 28th day, I walked into a uh, eucalyptus grove to go to sleep. The fog from the ocean had come up into the branches and the eucalyptus trees, when they haven't been cared for, all the bark comes off in these giant sheets like paper. The bark was laying on the ground about six inches thick and the forest looked almost exactly like the forest from The Princess Bride. Uh, No fire coming out of the ground, but it was the spooky one that the knights wouldn't go into, if you'll remember. Around midnight, I heard something land on the roof of my tent. And then it started sliding, but like it was resisting sliding, like it had fingernails that were trying to hold on. And then two more over here. A friend told me one time that if you see one rat, you have a hundred rats. I wondered what it meant if you felt Three rats. <laughs> like maybe there wasn't enough real estate in the trees, you know? I took all the food out of my backpack and I threw it into the woods as an offering to the rat gods. <laughs> On the 29th day, I put my backpack in some excrement. I was trying to figure out what kind of animal could make something so large. Later, I would learn that there are only 14 public restrooms in Big Sur, and there are over 6 million annual visitors. Yeah, it was was, was human shit. (laughs) I really wanted to whisper that to you guys. (laughs) On the 31st day, I was standing on the cliff as the sun was going down, looking out over the ocean, and there were no retirees. There were no rats. The sores on my arms and legs started to heal up. And the sun was dropping down, and it was growing larger and larger as it went. It started to flatten out against the horizon line. And down below, I could see the kelp and the seaweed moving across the rocks in the waves like hair in a slow-motion wind. And for a moment, I swore that I was standing so tall that I could see the bend of the earth looking out at all of its infinite vastness. It was the most at peace I had ever felt. When I think about that moment now, I realize that I, I'd never seen a sunset like that. I never have since. And it wasn't in spite of my sufferings, but it was in every way because of those things. It was something my mother knew, that you don't get to have joy without sorrow. You don't get to have a full life without a difficult one. You don't get to have love without heartbreak. 
and you don't get to have the full promise of the future without the complete embodiment of the failures of the past. Said I'd walk to San Francisco After everything was done Thought the noise and moving busy Kept my mind from really knowing what was gone When I finally saw it closing All those miles above the bay Well, I was only standing closer to the man I tried to lose along the way But if I'm being honest Yeah, if I'm being honest Well, I would tell him that it's a picture book It's a hospital gown It's an aspen tree in the summer breeze that she saw as waving hands it's a watching chair it's a holy company like a sailing ship hard rot in it that will never again float upon the sea when i finally saw it closing All those miles above the bay I found I was only standing closer To the man I tried to lose along the way But if I'm being honest Yeah, if I'm being honest well, I would tell her that it's a pair of jeans It's a rude awakening It's a fine life lived And the privilege of standing there in the afterlight It's a photograph Folded in my wallet to remind myself that what she left is only growing bigger over time. Thank you. Now I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you need to walk for 600 miles, that you need to battle a forest full of rats, lose a bunch of weight for no reason and walking forever uh, to find peace or to find what you're looking for. But I am suggesting that we live in a society that is increasingly uncomfortable with the idea of failure, with the idea of loss, with the idea of tragedy. And I don't think that we get anywhere that we want to go without traveling directly through the heart of those things. Sorrow and joy are holding hands. Of all the things that I learned, walking along the dusty highway in memory of my mother. Sorrow and joy reign supreme. I can see them there holding hands against the yellow of the California sunset and the cold blue of the Pacific Ocean, holding hands in a silhouette. And I learned that before I ever even left. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you.